I am perfectly fine with saying amen and letting that be the sermon. My goodness, that was powerful. Whew. I'm glad to be part of Steve's team. Such an honor to be part of such greatness. Man, don't they do a great job? Man, that was just awesome. Yes, absolutely. Today I'm going to share a sermon titled, I Just Don't Belong Here. And it's, uh, the text is from Romans 1, 6 and 2, 1 through 11. And I, I'll read that in just a minute. But I just want to share with you, have you ever been somewhere that you just really didn't feel like you fit in? Have you felt awkward or, or out of place? Uh, me and my son signed up for a gym membership. You know, we want to spend a little quality time together. And I had to go, we signed up at Wilmore to start with, and he had to go to Gunnersville to, to sign up, and we wanted to go to the Albertville location. But uh, I went in there, and, and Conan and Hercules were working out. <laughs> and I promise you, I felt out of place. So I, I went to the Crowder concert the other night, and a friend of mine bought me a T-shirt. And it's a black T-shirt with this big, bold, white letters on it. And it's the title of one of Crowder's songs. It says, Good God Almighty. So I figured the next time I go to the gym, I'll wear my T-shirt. And that'll keep them from sinning. They can just read my shirt, and I'll know what they're saying. Sometimes you just feel out of place. And in school, when we're young, we all just kind of mesh together. We don't really know the differences of each other. Uh, kindergarten, preschool, first, second, third grade, we're, we're all just kids. And as you get older, junior high, high school, you begin to segregate a little bit, kind of into groups. And, and you got popular kids, and you got rich kids, and you got poor kids, and you got those nerds with the pocket protectors. And, and you just got separated groups. And uh, as I made my way into high school in the ninth grade, I kind of find myself in the middle ground. You know, I, w I wasn't an athlete, but I wasn't the last one picked on the team. You know, I, I wasn't getting bullied, but I wasn't the most popular either. I, I was kind of somewhere in the middle. And, and in ninth grade, I took an art class. And uh, uh, in that art class, I, I just kind of fit in. And over the next three years, I would take art every year. And as a matter of fact, as my senior year, I took art class and was a student aide, so I had art twice my senior year. And in that class and amongst that class were all those different categories of people. There was a rich boy. There was a little hippie chick. There was this little Jehovah Witness boy. There was this drummer dude. And it was me. And, and we were all as different as day and night. But in that class, we fit together. In that class, we just united. As a matter of fact, our, our senior year, we had a project, and we painted a mural on the wall, and it was a block wall. And, and our project was we had to, we had to paint these uh, uh, superheroes busting through the wall. And each person had a, had a part of the project. One person would draw a character, and another person would draw a character. And, and the one girl, she drew the scenery in the background, and it was my job to, to paint the blocks and to make them look like they were broken and coming apart. And when we got done, it was an amazing, amazing project. Because when you walked into the class, it looked like those people were actually busting through the wall. And uh, as I looked at that... When we left that class and went to lunchroom or other areas of the school, we were still segregated. But in that class, we were united. And to me, that's a representation of the church today. We come together in church as a body, but a lot of times when we leave the church, we look at others as not like us. They need to be like us. I want you to be like us. And the way we go about that is not always effective. So, as I begin to read Paul, Paul's story, he's, he's talking to the Romans. And, and, he, and he's, he, he's talking to the church. And, he, and he's trying to tell them some things they're doing right and some things they're doing wrong. 
And uh, let's just read the scriptures and kind of get into it. Romans 1, 6, and then Romans 2, 1 through 11. This is what Paul says. And you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. You. That means you. And then Romans 2 gets a little more. Romans 2, 1 through 11 puts it like this. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself for you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for the Jew first and for also the Gentile. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good, for the Jew first and for also the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. We're all God's people. My message came from a, an opportunity of prayer, and I, I have a prayer list at Hey Good, and we go over it each week, and we add, and we take people away. And, and, and one of the guys on my prayer list, his name is Ricky. And Ricky is 60 years old, and he's in a nursing home, and he has uh, the early stages of dementia. And day after day, Ricky is frustrated. And, it, and he's aggravated, and he don't always know who the people are that come to visit him. And, it, and it, he, he's uncomfortable, and he just don't feel like he's home. And uh, as I began to pray for Ricky, I didn't know what to pray. I was like, Lord, how do I pray for Ricky? He said, pray that he belongs. And that, isn't that what we're all looking for? Isn't we just looking for somewhere to belong? Something to be part of? Something to be bigger than ourselves? You see, in my life, I was afforded an opportunity to belong. But I've lived on both sides of the fence. But what saved my life was the church. You see, when I came to church, I found a place to belong. I know I started out in the Baptist church. We all get confused sometimes. But <laughs> I, I started out in the Baptist church. And, man, I, I, I was participating in this singles class. And there's about 20 people in there. And it, it took me about two months to talk to any of them. I just sat in there quiet and listened. But I learned from that group is when we struggle, we can struggle together. That, that when we share our struggles with each other, it makes the burden a little lighter. And I also learned how to have fun. I learned how to laugh, and I learned how to have a good time in a Christian manner. See, I always thought before that you had to party in order to have fun. But then I learned that, man, you can have an amazing time with Jesus. And... Uh, He's always thinking out of the box and, and, and just doing things exciting. And I believe Jesus is an adrenaline junkie just like me. I think he likes to push people to the limit and get them out there and just really put them in situations that test them. And, man, I like that. Uh, that's why I'm standing here, boy. I, I like. <laughs> but, honestly, the church changed me. Uh, 
about a year later, I, spent, I only spent a year in a Baptist church, and I repented from that. And I, I came here, and, and, and I came here, and I, and I met some legends. And I, and I met uh, Jim Elliott was the first legend I met. Jim Elliott was my first Sunday school teacher, and then he passed me off to Jim and Lula Dobbs. And then they began to be my Sunday school teacher. And then, uh, then I met a couple more legends. I met Paul, uh, Bob Davis and Paul Miggs. And, and, and then I, I met John Federico. And, and the list just goes on and on and on and on and on. But this is what I learned. You see, Jim was my Sunday school teacher. And he passed me on in good hands to Jim and Lula Dobbs. Ed DeLorme invited me to help with the construction of Genesis, who introduced me to John Federico. John Federico challenged me to step up in leadership. Neil Gladden gave me an opportunity to lead Methodist men. You see, men after men after men, women after women after women engaged with me and made me feel like I belonged. They didn't look at me at who I was, who I had been. All they saw was where I was going and the potential I had stored up inside me. I could not see it myself. I promise you, I never saw what God had in store for me. I never knew in 2007 when I spoke at a Celebrate Recovery that that prayer would lead me to be a pastor. I had no idea. But the people of the church put me here. I had a Richard and Margaret Moore buddy, they went out on a limb and they sponsored me for an Emmaus walk. And later I found out once I was called into ministry that when I was called into ministry they was at 100%. Everybody they had sponsored became a pastor. And I believe if I'd had that information up front I might have done something different. But <laughs> Fortunately, I found out later what was going on. And, and, and another element was Stephen Smith. We, we, we cooked over here, Methodist men, and we would stay up all night smoking butts. And, and, and you may think that's work, and, and my, it, it was grueling because it's tough to stay up all night and then go to work the next day. But the reality of it was I was mentored. I was counseled. Anything I was struggling with, we would talk about. And I got unbiased, godly advice. You know how hard it is to come by? You know how hard it is to get somebody to tell you something without an agenda? Do you know what it's like to have godly counsel? I didn't know what I was getting. God had just put me in a place where I belong. I was struggling, and he was counseling and I didn't know. I thought I was just cooking. I thought I was just helping. I thought I was just serving. But I wasn't. God had put me in a place where I belonged. I see that now when I look back. But I didn't see that then when I was in the middle of it. You see, God's working in all of our lives. And it's hard to see when it's happening right now. As I continued down my prayer list, there was others. There's this little boy named Quentin, and he struggles with anxiety. He was a realtor. He is super smart. And he was attacked one day showing the house. And ever since, he has that anxiety that just overwhelms him. So now he thinks he belongs in his bedroom. His bedroom is a safe place where he don't have to deal with things that are scary. But in reality, he belongs to Christ. And it's scary to take that next step and to step out and go to church and to find your place. But church, it's our place to encourage those people to come. Another one was uh, Greg. He's waiting on a transplant list. He's waiting for somebody to die. And, and, and somebody needs to belong to God in heaven in order for him to belong here on earth. And, and it gets complicated. And it, it, you don't want to wish death on anybody, but you don't want to wish death on anybody. 
for one to live, one must die. But isn't that what Paul said? We are to die to ourselves, to live for Christ. And then I got, I got, I got to the heartbreakers. And, it, and it's heartbreakers. It's my little foster kids. There was two little foster kids that came to my church, Molly and Nevaeh. I've never been the same. It broke my heart. Foster kids are longing for a place to belong. They're looking for a family. They want to fit in. They just want to be part of something. Most of them are young and didn't choose this life. But a lot of times when you go to a foster parent, there's other foster kids, there's natural kids, there's a lot of drama, there's a lot of chaos. You don't always stay there long. You might stay there a month, you might stay there a day, you might stay there a year, you might stay there forever. You don't know. But it just breaks my heart to know there are kids out there that feel like they don't belong. Don't they know whose they are? Don't they know that they are the child of God, the creator of the earth. A kid who's been removed from their family usually carries the blame. They feel like they've done something that's their fault. They're usually carried to a strange place and expected to just belong. It's our job as a church to make people feel as if they belong. Ty Paul writes in the scriptures that he's tired of us spending so much time in judgment that we miss the opportunity to be the church. We judge other Christians. Pentecostal are too loud, run around too much. Them Baptists, you know, they just worried about eating. The reality of it is we're all God's people. When we walk outside these doors, everybody you engage in at every moment is a child of God. They were created for a purpose. They're not perfect. They're not, they don't look, they can have earrings, tattoos, they can be fat, skinny, but they're still his child. But there's two key elements you need to know when you leave this church. When you leave this church and you encounter somebody, there's two things that you have to operate out of, and that's grace and truth. They have to be together. They cannot be separated. You cannot go out of this church and show somebody grace and not the truth. But you cannot go out of this church and just beat the truth down their throat and not show them grace. They must work coherently together. You cannot separate them. You cannot just show grace. You cannot just show truth and be an effective Christian. For people to know that it's okay to come in here, they look at the church as a place of hypocrisy, a place of judgment, a place where people look down on you, and they're just making assumptions because the reality is they don't know any of us or anything about us, but they've heard from the world that this is not the place you're supposed to be, when in reality, this is the place. This is where I found I belong, and it's my job to make others understand that. It's all of our jobs to make others understand that until we can get the point across that the church is a place of healing and hope, not condemnation. The church has got a bigger role to fill. Now, I'm not beating all y'all up. There's some of y'all doing a fantastic job. And on days I do great, and there's other days not so much because sometimes I catch myself sitting in Arby's drinking a drink and I'll see somebody go through the drive through with a large combo and they didn't need it. While I sit there and eat my large sandwich and my large Coke. It's just built in us. Sometimes we just judge people for no reason 
when the reality is they're a child of God. When you go to Walmart at 2 o'clock in the morning, that's children of God. I know they're still in their pajamas, but they're still children of God. We're all children of God, and if we could look at each other that way. When we leave here, if we could just look like God looked. God's being patient. Yes, the world's getting crazy, sin's getting rampant, but God just wants all of his people to come to him. And the only way that can happen is through us. God's Holy Spirit pricking each and every one of our hearts so that we'll share the love with somebody we know. Share the love with somebody that we encounter. Share the love with those opportunities we have day in and day out. In a blended family, it's very important for a child to feel like he belongs. A foster child is even more difficult, especially as they begin to end teenage years, 14, 15, 16 years old, and you're still in the foster system. You had not been adopted out. You really struggle with why you're even here and where you belong. But the reality of it is, aren't we all foster children? Aren't we all longing to be part of God's kingdom, trying to find our place where we belong? He's all gave us gifts and purposes, and, and, and we're looking for that and how to fit in. It's built in us, subconscious. A lot of times we get caught up with buying cars, trucks, boats. We get into unhealthy relationships or have shopping addictions or all these things trying to fill that void inside of us when the reality is we're just looking for Christ. We just don't know where to look. We're looking in the wrong places. We're looking in other people to make us happy, to fill a void. We're looking at other things. We're looking at substances. We're looking at chemicals. We're looking at all these other things of the world, and they never fulfill us. To me, the church should be like Harbor Freight. Now, when I walk into Harbor Freight, they greet me. Welcome to Harbor Freight. And I'm still not sure what to say. Do I say okay? Do I say good morning? Do I say welcome? Thank you? I get confused a little bit, but I appreciate the greeting. And then as I begin to make my way down the aisle, they say, can we help you find anything, sir? I said, no, sir, I'm just looking. But as I make my way down the aisle, there is item after item after item that will help make me do any task easier. Shouldn't that be the representation of the church? Shouldn't somebody walk into these doors and be greeted immediately? Shouldn't we offer assistance? Is there anything? Do you, do you know where the coffee and donuts are? How about the restrooms? Do you know about Sunday school? Do you know about this mission project we got coming up? Shouldn't we be extending every invitation of every opportunity to get people involved and feel like they belong? I believe that Harbor Freight can do it. I think we can. I think we can do it. And I think if we do do it, more people will begin to feel a little more comfortable in church. It's okay if they're not perfect. I wasn't perfect when I started church. I'm close now. I still got a little work left, but, you know. <laughs> there should be endless resources in which we engage others to better their walk in Christ. The church should be a place where we can come get the tools necessary to walk a little closer with Jesus. Anyone should be welcome through these doors. Ladies, maybe it's Hobby Lobby for y'all. Maybe it's Belk or Ulta. I know Harbor Freight's probably not speaking to you quite like us guys. 
But the mission should be the same. We should be intentional about reaching out to others and coming alongside those that are already here and showing everyone how to belong to Jesus Christ. Praise team, if you'll make your way up. God just put it on my heart this morning that, that uh, an invitation would be necessary. That maybe today is the day that, that, that you decided that you wanted to belong to Christ. Maybe you already belong to Christ and, and he's just pricked your heart that you're tired of looking at others in a human manner and maybe you would like to begin looking at them through Jesus' perspective. So if today's your day, I'll be standing right down here on the front and I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to pray salvation. I'd love to pray healing. I'll pray anything, you name it. I'm here and available. Thank you.